listening to Migrant Bus and Prison Podcast, a space dedicated to history, art, culture, politics, sociology, anthropology, and many other subjects. This episode is part of the Languages and Societies in the Maghreb Lecture Series and was recorded on the 12th of September 2017 in Algiers for the Centre d'études maghrébines en Algérie. Sema. In this podcast, we welcome Dr. Elizabeth Ventress, archaeologist, honorary visiting professor at the University College London, and creator of Fasti Online, presenting a lecture titled Volubilis Between Romans, Araba, and Idris I. Hello. This podcast is about the excavations that I carried out between 2000 and 2005 on behalf of UCL, University College London, and INSAP, the Moroccan Institute of Heritage, with my co-director, Hassan Liman, from the INSAP. It's an excavation of one of the most famous sites in Morocco, the town of Vroubris, which is visited every year by thousands of tourists who come to see its really lovely mosaics. Indeed, it's the best-known Roman site in Morocco. Now, Volubil is, was occupied before Rome, and we know very little about that. It's a Mauritanian town that was probably founded in the 3rd century BC. And it was occupied after Rome. And what we were specifically asked to do was to find out more about that after Rome because Rome abandoned northern Morocco. You can see a map on the next slide of Morocco with the site marked in red. Rome withdrew its administration and its army and its defense right up to that peninsula that you can see at the top of Morocco that starts with the site of Lixus. So it was always assumed that at that point, Olivius was left to itself and it fell to the barbarians. Now, the first thing our project actually showed is that there were houses, elite houses with fancy mosaics, like the one you see here of the Bath of Diana. This is the next slide, which were still occupied because, as the next slide shows, They were decorated with mosaics that couldn't possibly date to the third century when it was abandoned, or when it was theoretically abandoned, but must be fourth century. This is a mosaic of a circus in which there's a very playful and jokey idea that it's animals and that are pulling the chariots. This is definitely fourth century. So there were definitely still elite houses, occupied by elite people who were even witty at the, that, in that time. Now, we also know, however, that at a certain moment, that occupation retreated. And my colleague, Almar Akaraz, many years ago now, showed that the wall that you see on the next slide that seems to slice the site into two unequal bits running down the middle there, was a rampart of the 6th century AD. So what he suggested was that occupation considered, continued under some form in the Roman site, which you see on the right, but then it shrank to the hillside above the water, uh, the stream down below, and they made a much smaller site which sat on top of the Roman town. And this idea seemed to be confirmed by the inscription that you see on the next slide, which is one of a number that are really well dated because what they do is they're epitaphs for various people, they're written in Latin, and they give the year of the province, which is the year after the province was founded. So we're able, in this case, to say this inscription must date from 566, 
and in fact, it's one of the latest inscriptions in Roman North Africa. So this story seemed to hold together very well, but there were a number of problems with it. The first problem is that there are no coins whatsoever between 425 and 400, 575. So that's 150 years without a single coin coming in. Were they that poor? There's also no pottery. And there's all sorts of reasons to wonder what went on in the meantime. So the first site that we excavated that you see on the next slide, marked in red, which we called Site D, was inside that rampart, just inside it, and it was aimed at finding out everything we could about the medieval phase right there. You can see on the next slide a picture of how it was when we found it, um, with the grass right off. Now, once we'd gotten through the medieval layers, which I'll be talking about next, we dug a sondage, which you can see on the next slide, to get down to Roman levels. And it really took some doing, because the Roman levels turned out to be a meter, 70 centimeters, below the medieval floors. So you have the entire destruction of a house. You don't have something that... Um, accumulated or changed gradually over time, you have something that fell down. And specifically, the next sh slide shows what it fell down on top of. In that little hole, we found an amphora that was crushed in place. Somebody had somehow managed to lose the bits, but the rest of it was all there. And we found this articulated skeleton of a cat who was trapped inside the building when it fell down. So it really looks like something very sudden, and we don't have a lot of doubt from that that we're talking about an earthquake. But there's actually other evidence of the earthquake. Now, Volubilis is famous not only for its mosaics, but as you can see on the next slide, for its truly extraordinary bronze statues. Volubilis has more brown statues than anywhere else in North Africa put together. All of them. There are 565 fragments that have been catalogued. Some of them are absolutely intact, like these two wonderful busts that came from the house whose mosaics I was showing before, which is known as the House of Venus. Now, the extraordinary thing about these busts, the one on the left is of Juba II as a young boy. It's completely lovely, and it was found on the pedestal where the house had fallen on top of it. The other one was found just nearby. So when the house was destroyed or abandoned, people didn't go and take their bronzes with them because bronze is really valuable. You can make jewelry out of it, you can make coins out of it, you can do all kinds of things. And in a normal Roman town, any bronze you find is a matter of scraps. But at Volubilis, in many of the houses, you found whole statues lying on the floors where they had apparently stood. And this very much suggests to me that the owners had all died or gone away and not re recovered the um, statues that they left behind. So it's our idea that there was a massive earthquake somewhere around 425 AD and that the site was then abandoned for the next 100, 150 years. Now, at this point, we're going to introduce some history from texts. And this history deals with a man called Idris I, who is very central to what happened next at Volubilis. Idris I descended from the prophet's daughter, Fatma, and uh, her husband, Ali, and therefore he was part of the Alid dynasty. Now, though they sided with the Abbasids, 
when the Abbasids overthrew the Umayyads, they then had difficulties with them and went to war and were soundly defeated in a battle called the Battle of Fak. Idris was one of the very few survivors of the family and he had to flee in disguise, accompanied by his faithful slave Rashid, all the way across North Africa, and he eventually shipped up in Tangiers. All this is told, told us by much later sources, but it seems to be in bare bones true. So in Tangiers, they say, well, you can't stay here. We don't much want you. But why don't you go south to a town called Walili, which is what the Lubulis had become in the meantime, where there's a Berber tribe called the Oraba, who'd probably be delighted to see you. It's the major town in the region. So Idris does go to Walili, the Berber tribe of the Oraba, and its chief, Ishaq, are indeed delighted to see him. And I think the reason for this welcome is very clear. He was a descendant of the Prophet that made him holy. It made him a central figure in Islam. And this tribe was already Islamized, um, though perhaps they were slightly heretical. They were absolutely happy to welcome somebody who would give them better Islamic legitimacy, because Berbers at that time were always suspected of being only faintly Islamic and probably pagan. So Ishaq takes him in, he gives him a girl of the tribe called Kans to marry, and he accepts Idris's leadership in a full three years, during which Idris manages to conquer all of northern Morocco and as far as down in the mountains to the south, where there was a major silver mine, where he commenced a silver coinage, which is very beautiful and very important, and always mentions Ali. So what we think we excavated, if you look at the next slide, you'll see that same site after several years of excavation, is a part of the town that the Orvo were living in. We know this from the fact that pottery is of the 9th century, and uh, it, the town may have been occupied earlier, but this is our first occupation on the particular site. And what we seem to have is a sequence of Berber houses. You can see on the next slide a plan of the different phases on this site, where you have a series of small rectangular houses that doesn't change very much. It does change. And on the next slide, you can see the first of these, big rectangular building with a stone foundation, probably mud walls. And to the right, you can see uh, an area where possibly for storage, possibly for artisan activity, they may have been involved in glass making. The next slide shows another of these buildings. Again, a really substantial rectangle built in a rather Roman style with mud walls, divided in two at a certain point. Again, possibly living area and stables or storage behind. But it's the third house here and on the next slide, which is possibly the most interesting. Again, big rectangular, again, stone foundations, mud walls on top. But here you can see a division between a room in front, which occupies about two thirds of the building, has a silo, has a hearth, has different, has a good floor of beaten earth. And in back, where it's a bit lower, the floor is less good, and there's a great big post hole in the center which probably supported a lo loft, which would have been used for storage. Now this resembles, for anybody who studies uh, North Africa and North African housing, a very famous building type, which was described by the anthropologist Pierre Bourdieu as the 
essence of the Kabiri house. You see it on the left in this slide from his illustrations, which comprises a front room where various activities like weaving take place and a back room where the lower bit is used for a stable and the loft above is used for sleeping and storage. Our reconstruction of this house is shown in the next slide. It's clear that not all the houses were the same, but it's still pretty remarkable to find something that corresponds so closely to what Bourdieu imagined. On the next slide, you can see uh, another vision of the site from the other side, and in the front, you've got a step leading down to a street. Now, this is important because it divides uh, two phases of the house of the site in half, but particularly because on the street, when it's made, or shortly thereafter, we found a dirham, this beautiful silver coin shown on the next slide, um, of Idris the first. So this is a, a really spectacular find, um, particularly because. It sets us very firmly in our chronology as contemporary with Idris's arrival at Walili, or Rubles. Where was that happening? Well, the next slide shows you our second site, which we called Site B, which, as you can see, is outside the walls, outside the Roman and medieval walls, on the floodplain of the river Khomein down below. Now, this site had, we weren't the first people, people to get there. The site had been pretty devastated by excavations in the 1950s, carried out by somebody who was a very good historian and a very bad archaeologist. So it took us a long time to clean it up, and there wasn't much left when we finished. So some of this has to be taken with a grain of salt. But what is striking is the building, the only building that you can see um, on the left, which is a very early bath building or hammam. The next slide shows you the front room where one came in through a door, very beautiful paving recovered from clearly a Roman building, and then benches against the side walls where you could sit, where you could chat, you could possibly change. From there, you could move into the pool that you can see on the next slide, with three steps leading down to it, very nice hydraulic cement. That really could be a Roman bath, but the rest not. And from there, you could move into the warm part of the bath through a vestibule, you'll see in a minute. On the next slide, you see the hot room. Its floor is missing, but it was above that channel there, which carried hot air passed up through flues to create the atmosphere of a really intense sauna. Um, in the back corners, you see two pools, and these were fed with hot water, which was heated in this um, tank in back, which would have held a huge bronze cauldron, fire underneath it. And from there, water was channeled into those two pools you saw in the hot room. So the whole building is really pretty fancy for the ninth century. And this reconstruction, shown on the next slide, um, gives an idea of what it looked like. What's really interesting is that it's the first building that was put up in that area. Everything else came later, but the need for a good bath was clearly felt by the people who were building it. And there's only one bit of decoration, which you can see on the next slide. That's that shield-shaped relief which is decorating the wall, very carefully picked out by the plaster on the wall. And that relief, we know, comes from the structure you see on the next slide, which is the arch of, triumphal arch of Caracalla 
So it's clear that they went and deliberately picked out that relief and stuck it in the baths for reasons both of ornamentation and possibly to show who was boss. Now the buildings around it, which came later, but maybe not more than a couple of months later, were, as I say, not very legible, but they consisted of structures that were very different from what you saw up in the Berber village. Here you see a general view of the site with the hammam in the middle, and to the left of it, to the south of it, you can see a, a large courtyard building with two rectangular rooms and a huge courtyard between them. Now, these rooms were entered directly from the street in front, which you can see on the next slide, in front of the reception room, which was entered directly from the street. Now, that's important because your standard Arab house domestic space is never entered directly from the street. You always go through a bent entrance in order to avoid being able to look straight into the courtyard where you might see women. And on the right, you can see a sort of low bench um, which is covered with plaster. Here's another view of it from the other end of the room. And you can see it's covered with a nice pink plaster. You can imagine cushions set on it. And it might be where whoever was receiving guests was doing the receiving, was seated. Beyond that large space with the two uh, reception rooms was a second courtyard that I'm not showing here, but which seemed to be instead domestic with a kitchen, hearth, tons of coins, tons of pottery, tons of bones, and a rather more obviously domestic occupation. But the most interesting courtyard of all was on the other side of the bath building. And this is called Building 4, which you can see the plan of on the next slide. It had, again, a series of wings around a large courtyard. Now, in the wings, you found traces of metalworking, a great big piece of iron slag, traces of cotton working, and a series of other activities of which there weren't really much left for us to see. But in the courtyard itself, you had a great series of deep pits, which you can see in the next slide under excavation. The next slide shows one of these with a half section. It was over two meters deep, um, two meters wide. It contained tons of pottery and trash, but we don't, we aren't in any doubt that it wasn't dug to put trash in. This would seem a real waste of time. It contained some burnt grain. It was originally intended, as the plaster on its walls show, to hold grain. Because after the Roman period, there's a change in technology which involves putting grain underground, where, strangely enough, it preserves fairly well if it's kept without oxygen. You cover it up. And the advantage of this technique over the Roman horium, or grain storage open in buildings, is that when you get a plague of... Um, grasshoppers, cicadas, uh, which periodically happens in North Africa, they can't get at it. So that up until the 1950s, in the villages near Volubilis, everybody kept their grain in those silos. Now, we had in the courtyard, we had nine of these huge pits. They were very carefully aligned with the wings of the building, and they clearly went with it. So it looks as if this was a building in which collective storage was really important. And we can calculate from the size of the pits that there were perhaps 30 people living there at any one time. The next slide shows you a reconstruction of how we 
imagine this building looked. You can see the hammam in the middle, the big courtyard building on the left, the reception area, which we interpret as what you could call the Dar el Imara or the governing area, the administrative area, and on the right, uh, domestic housing. Now, we have to admit this is not a desert palace. This is really crummy. But let us take into account that the available building force is coming from the Oruba tribe, that the building techniques are what they are, and that the uh, building was possibly occupied for only a very short time. Its position outside the walls of the Berber town is not at all unusual. It's a very common thing, in fact, um, we can see it in the Eastern Mediterranean, that the Arab arrivals, new arrivals, settle just outside the walls so as not to, on the one hand, bother the people who already occupy the inside and to keep themselves separate. The next slide shows you a reconstruction of the area of Tremsen, um, where the old Roman town, which you could see at the top, was defended by a late wall. The new Arab town, Agadir, is settled to the south of it, and the mosque is built between the two, so that there's this very clear separation between the older and the newer occupants. We haven't much doubt that this was the headquarters of Idris and what became his household. The next slide shows you the radiocarbon dates that we have, um, the ones, the top three, oh, there's one that's very early, but the top three show you a cluster around the end of the ninth century. And we know that Idris arrived at Walida in 879, perhaps 878, but in any case there. And the radiocarbon date for those first three um, structures, the other ones come from later ones, coincides really neatly with that. We also have coins from Idris, and we have this very different and new structure of buildings with a courtyard, which we haven't seen before. Now, there are a lot of people that say, oh, yes, Arab houses come from Roman houses. They don't. They come from large, enclosed spaces against whose walls, I mean, you can build houses. You don't have to, but you can. In any case, these walled, enclosed spaces protect the group that lives in them, whether it's a family or anything else. The next slide shows, that, shows you the contrast between our reconstruction of the Idrisid headquarters and the Berber houses up above, with their very unclear enclosures. Perhaps we're dealing with families that are related. We don't know how it's really working, but it's a very different concept of space. Now, there are all kinds of other differences between these spaces, and it's to the extent that if we didn't have the radiocarbon and the pottery that shows that they're absolutely contemporary in the late 9th century, we would think they were completely different settlements. So, this is carried out in the pottery. Um, they both have modeled handmade pottery, which you can see on the next slide, but uh, there's rather more of it in the Berber town, whereas in site B, Idris's headquarters, we have rather more decorated pottery, which you can see on the next slide. There are also more large storage jars in the Idrisid town. What's really clear is that there's many, many more coins in the case of the 
uh, Idris's headquarters. So let me see, there are um, 22 coins only in the sector D that are dated between 650 and 930, whereas down in Idris's headquarters there were 98. Um, so a completely different sort of economy. Um, there's some production, obviously, at site uh, D. There's possibly con the production of glass. They're, they're involved to some extent in commerce, but not at all on the same level. And down on, on site B, they're actually working, working cotton. Now, you can't grow cotton anywhere near Volubilis. So they're importing cotton from a long way away where there's going to be enough water to grow it. And they're working it down there. That's really new. You don't have cotton in Roman uh, North Africa. And finally, you have the bones from the two sectors, which are which present really interesting differences. They're eating differently. We've already seen it, in fact, in the grains that you find in those silos um, down at Adrisa's headquarters. They eat a lot of durum wheat, um, which is much hardier and seems to be an introduction of the Arab period. It's called, um, it's actually got a name like that, as in Italian it's called grano saraceno or saracen much. Finally, their meat eating habits are completely different. Up in the village, the Oroba are consuming 33% of their bones are beef. And the rest are more or less all sheep. There's a little tiny bit of pork, but basically they're Islamized. Down on the floodplain in Idris's headquarters, they're eating almost entirely mutton, um, though they're eating very nice cuts of it and it's well butchered and dressed. Over time, up in the village, they eat less beef, but it still remains much higher than the 16% that we find on the floodplain. So if you look at your next slide, you see an image of these two areas. It's very sketchy, but it gives you the general idea of the headquarters of Idris outside the walls and this om almost rural environment inside them. The general impression that those headquarters give you is something really temporary. It's an unfinished project. It's something that clearly was intended to be fixed up in a much better way when Idris had finished his project. But here we have to return to the history. Because, of course, he didn't get a chance to finish it. After three years of adventures and conquests and the formation of a new state, an Abbasid spy managed to insert himself into Idris's in entourage at Walili and to poison him, some say, with a tooth medicine. So Idris dies, and that's the end of that, except that he leaves his wife, Kants, pregnant. Now, malicious people say she was pregnant for a very long time, but we don't need to believe that. She has a son who is called after his father, Idris, so he's Idris II. And Idris is in no condition to uh, fix up the crummy headquarters. Idris's faithful slave, Rashid, runs the show for the next 18 years, but when Idris II gets his majority, he says, I've had enough. It's really too crummy. He doesn't get on as well with his grandfather. He's hack as he would have liked to, and he goes off to Fez, which his father had conveniently founded 18 years before, and on the other side of the river builds what becomes the very glorious medieval town that survives to this day. And at this point, Volubilis 
returns to its previous state, if not less so, because I imagine many of the Oroba went with Idris II to Fez. It's not abandoned at that point. There's a group, probably refugees from a revolt at Cordoba, who settled there for about 50 years building houses on top of Idris's old headquarters, but perhaps still using the baths. But that site down on the floodplain is definitively abandoned in the 11th century. We, don't, we know, don't know much about what happens up in town. Our site, Site D, was abandoned for a long time. But then in the 14th century, we see a house there and a new rampart is built along the line of the old one, which is it's basically reinforcing. It's interesting here that something is causing continuity, and I very much suspect that that something is the tomb not only of Idris I, but also of Idris II, because both are said by authors from El Bekri, in the 11th century, all the way to Leo Africanus in the 15th, to be buried at the site of Walila. Now, what would be typical in North Africa would be that members of the family would form a group, a zawiya, that would protect these tombs. Now, the first real mention of the tombs is that in 1318, Idris's body was found at Walila, wrapped in its shroud, and caused a great mass of pilgrims to come. The Mer Marinid Sultan had to send troops to control this mass of people and bring them to order. Somewhat later, he discovered the corpse of Idris II conveniently in Fez, where it was easy to build him a really magnificent tomb and enhance the prestige of his dynasty with the tomb and the associated mosque. We may perhaps see a similar operation going on very much later with Idris II's tomb. Because now, as some of you will know, this is found not at Walida, but at Moulay Idris, three kilometers away, which you can see on this final slide. There's a great, big, magnificent tomb built in 1720 by the Sultan Muri Ismail, who lived in nearby Meknes. And today it constitutes Morocco's premier pilgrimage site. So how did it move? Well, as I said, Leo Africanus is still there in the 15th century and describes very carefully the ruined towers, town walls, and monuments of Volubilis. There's no doubt that he's talking about Walila. However, Muli Idris, the town, has already got some traces of archaeological traces in the 14th century, and it may by then have become a much more dominant settlement than the very small Zawiya that was found at Walila. So what could be happening here is that the Zawiya agreed to move the body to Muri Idris in return for the construction of that very splendid mausoleum, or probably its uh, predecessor, which was destroyed um, and then rebuilt in 1720. But what's interesting is that at that point, we see not a site of memory at Walila, which simply becomes known as the Kasar Faraun, which means the fortress of the pharaoh. It's not associated in any way, in spite of all these texts, with Idris I. Now, Idris I is terribly important to all the, Mor the Moroccan monarchy today, and to all the dynasties in the past, it is the founding dynasty. So this disassociation with the site is actually very interesting. We can only imagine that it's caused by the focus 
on the new tomb at Muidris, and that the forgetting of the whole picture in Walila is an almost deliberate act of loss of memory rather than of memorialization. It's an interesting site. We're going to go back. We're going to start excavations in 2018 again, looking at the center of the medieval site to see whether there really was continuity, whether we can trace any evidence of the Zawiya that I only hypothesize exists, and again demonstrate, if possible, um, that the site was abandoned in an earthquake. We're also going to look at the early 8th century before the arrival of Idris and see what went on there. But it was fun the first time. It's going to be great the second. And new questions will always be there to answer. Thank you for listening to Maghreb in Past and Present Podcasts. Other episodes are available on our website www.themagrebpodcast.com as well as on iTunes and Podbean. For more information on our podcasts, like our Facebook page, Maghreb in Past and Present Podcasts, subscribe to the SEMA newsletter at www.sema-northafrica.org or visit the webpage of the American Institute for Maghreb Studies. See you soon for a new episode.